Hello and welcome to my channel. This video is specifically around ancestry DNA matches. I've made two precursor videos to this, one around DNA settings, so you get in the most out of ancestry DNA, and one about DNA itself. So you should have really a working knowledge of DNA to understand how matches work. Now this video is based on a presentation that I've made to my genealogy group. So this is a PowerPoint. I will be showing the actual ancestry system as we presented this directly from my PowerPoint at the time. So there are a couple of ways to get to DNA matching once the test has been activated, either through the drop down or through this DNA results summary that gives you a portfolio of all the different things you can do with your DNA and ancestry. Now there are four different screens on the DNA matching side itself that we can take a look at. The first screen is by location. Now it's important to remember that this is the location of the test taker or the person who manages the test anyway. It's nothing to do with the tree. So in my case, I'm British, but I live in Florida and it's showing me in Florida. So really this is just giving you a spot check of where all the people currently reside within your match portfolio. And I can drill down on these dots and actually get to a different people that I have matches with. So if I click on the UK, this is what I'd get. And I can keep drilling down until I can see the particular match I have. And then I can click on that match and go to the details of the match that we'll be seeing a little bit later. Now, while we're talking about matches, it's important to remember not to be disappointed if you communicate with a match and you don't hear anything back. This is very, very common. Many people do DNA and then don't go into Ancestry again, or for whatever reason will not reply. So don't feel bad if you connect with people in your family tree that show shared DNA and they don't get back to you. This is very, very common. The next screen is by Ancestor, and you'll see this is a familiar screen. This is through lines, and I made a video about through lines. So no need to go into this other than this is just another way of getting to your through lines portfolio. The next screen is a new screen. You can see this by the, the beta uh, flash mark there. This is a nice screen from Ancestry. It's breaking down um, our DNA matches by parent line, maternal and paternal. Now when you first see the ethnicity breakdown is parent one, parent two. For most genealogists, it's pretty easy to figure out which is which parent, and you can change that to paternal and maternal. And then there'll be a bunch of unassigned ones, depending on the date that the test was processed. But this is just a neat way of showing this. It gives me a breakdown of communities, the ethnicity, and the common names by each paternal line. But where we normally go, where we spend most of our time when we're looking at DNA matches, is in the all matches key so we'll just go there right now and this is what we normally see and this is a breakdown this is currently sorted by a nearest relative and what makes ancestry's dna matching so powerful is the number of filters searches and sorts i can do through this system and this is where the power comes in for me to be able to do my research and break things down now the first filter is viewed and unviewed and you'll see a blue dot next to a name if you've not viewed it and this will enable me to just quickly pass through my matches to see if there's any new matches I've not processed yet. The next one very powerful is common ancestors. So basically if we have ancestors as well as DNA in common I can sort by this. Now I can show you how a little bit later to how to sort by specific ancestors, but this will give me a grouping of DNA matches that have common ancestor. The notes function in, in DNA is I can for each match I can create notes. So depends how you want to process your matches. I make notes basically around anybody I've connected with recently and how I've managed to connect those people to my family tree. So there'll be a number of nodes. So I can just bring up the ones that I've connected nodes to. 
Now the next three have got drop downs. So I can look at trees. I can just filter by publicly linked trees, unlinked trees, or privately linked trees. Now unlinked trees, in many cases, the person has just not linked their DNA to their tree and it will have common ancestors maybe in that tree. So it's worth looking at unlinked trees. Um, it sometimes gives you a start point that you can use to work that shared match into a relative. DNA and ancestry is, is filtered by center morgans here. So I can look at close matches, distance matches, or custom center morgan range. And we'll talk about you know, in the future slide about these different kinds of ranges and what center morgans are. But here I can just filter out. Groups are one of the most powerful filters available on the DNA matches. I can I can group by and filter by groups for the preset groups like paternal, maternal, or unassigned. But the main power here is using groups that I define. Now there are a number of ways of defining different groups based on the way you want to investigate your matches. There's a methodology called a leads method that a lot of people use, and I'll give you information about that later on in the presentation. For my part, I've used my great-grandparents, given a color to each one of those, and then I will assign that color once I've investigated that match. And I also use the star to indicate somebody I'm talking to over ancestry message. So that allows me then to group different filters and look at different family groups. The search and search function are very, very powerful too. I can search both on the match name and the surname in the matches tree. So beyond common ancestors, I can start looking for specific ancestors and use similar surnames. And I can look at birth location. So this is very, very powerful when I'm starting to investigate groups of matching or family grouping. And I can sort by relationship or day. So these together, the search function and sort function together with the filters are very, very powerful. When I start looking at an individual match, Ancestry gives me some information. Now, this, this for this particular match, PP, Ancestry is telling me that PP is a second cousin. I share 208 center morgans, which is 3% of my DNA. So on the paternal side, public link tree, common ancestor. You can see that from the green tag or indicator on the logo there that this person is in my tree already. Now the key thing to bear in mind is that the second cousin designation is just a default. As we know with DNA, it provides a relationship, not a relative. So I don't know how these people are related to me. Now PP could be my second cousin, but equally could be my first cousin twice removed. So it's not until I've done my own investigation and I can color code this in my way that I know what the true relationship is. So be very, very careful when you look at the default relationships. Just because Ancestry is giving you a relationship, by no means is it correct. The other thing is we want to talk about center morgans, and there's a, a PowerPoint slide coming up which will give you a little bit more information about that. But center morgans are the probability, the units of probability in some way, of ancestors being related. Now there's a, a roughly 6,800 of these center morgans, so you'll see different numbers based on a range. And let's go and look at what those ranges could be. And this slide is from Blaine Bettinger, and this is his shared CMF project. And this looks very complicated, it looks like homework if you like, but this is giving the basic average center Morgan relationship between relatives. So between myself and the sibling, the average would be 2613 in terms of center morgans, 2,613. But there's a fairly big range behind that. So when we talk about people sharing 50% of their DNA or 25% or whatever that is, that's just an average. We can share a large differential in that, in that way. As you can see, as the relationships get further away from the middle, the number of center morgans becomes less and less. And you can see right out to the edge, there is a number of zero matches. 
So even though somebody could be my third cousin, it could be that I'm sharing no DNA with them whatsoever. So this is where it becomes very important if you've done a DNA sample of a close relative, a sibling or a parent, you can look at the matches on their DNA too, because obviously they have DNA that you don't have. And they may be showing matches that are very close to you that you don't have. So if you had the luxury of close relatives DNA, beyond just looking at your own matches, you should be looking at their matches and using that as a composite to come up with a family hierarchy. The simplistic chart, which I showed here in my uh, DNA overview is, is this one. It just gives you the averages so without looking at the complex one from Blaine Bettinger, and we can look at that on, you can Google that anytime. This is what you should remember. These are the averages. But what this tells you is that the average amount of DNA shared could come from different relatives. So if I'm looking at 25%, which is a very high amount, it could be a grandparent, it could be an aunt or uncle, it could be a niece or nephew, or it could be a grandchild. So as I said, the research to your family tree to back up your relationship is the key part of how you process these matches. Now going back to ancestry matches, once I click on a match, click on a name, another screen pops up and this is what I'm showing here at the bottom of the screen. And the first thing to see here is that I can change the relationship. So talking about it was a second cousin, if that's not the right relationship, I can go to edit relationship and change this relationship to whatever it should be based on my own research and even change the side of the family that's coming to. Below this breakdown is the tree that is publicly linked to this match. So it's giving me a quick look on the tree and I can expand that tree. It's also giving me common ancestors that ancestry is predicting that we share. Now again, like a lot of things Ancestry predicts, it needs your own research. And in this particular case, I've actually given my own uh, view of what this should be in my notes. So this is very powerful, and we can expand the tree and do our own research work. And again, I can mes message PP to see how uh, her and my matches work together. A very interesting feature of shared matches is shared ethnicity. And this will show me how my ethnicity profile maps to my shared match. And in this case, you can see it's very, very close, confirming that we come from a very similar background. It could be that we have some differences based on even close relatives have differences based on the DNA profile that's been handed down. So this is a fun part. Um, it often causes a lot of consternation, I think, uh, when people look at ethnicity because this goes back a way further back than the actual DNA we're looking at in terms of shared match. Then finally, the most important part here that helps me resolve our family hierarchy, which is shared matches. So these are matches that I have and my match has, basically shared matches. And now I can start grouping matches together in terms of if, if A shares with B and I share with B as well, then we know we've got some hierarchy together. And this forms the key to bringing together groups of relatives and investigating people that don't have trees or are not connected to trees. But remember your close relatives that I mentioned earlier on, they will have people that they're related to that are not in your matches. So it's important, again, if you have access to close relatives tests, to see who they share matches with, and if you're sharing matches with your close relatives. So this becomes a mathematical exercise in many ways to look at trends and groups. Now within this area, I can also filter. And again, this, this is very, very powerful from Ancestry. And it makes Ancestry DNA matching so useful. 
so I can filter by unviewed, common ancestors, notes, trees, and groups again. So I'm not sharing, not filtering my matches, I'm now filtering shared matches. I mentioned earlier on a methodology for grouping these together. This is from Dana Leeds, it's called the Leeds Method, uh, www.danaleeds.com, or just Google the Leeds Method. This is a way of using a spreadsheet to actually color code and group matches together. Now, I hope you found this useful. It's a lot of work to do this properly when we're trying to manage matches, but it's so worthwhile because once you have a match and you can back, back this up with your profile within your normal research, paperwork research, then you can key it into a relative that perhaps you didn't know you had before. So I hope you found this useful. If you do, please like, please subscribe. I'll be putting Ancestry videos up on a regular basis. Have a great day and enjoy your ancestry.